Shabbat Shalom. So not long ago, I, uh, I went to my high school reunion. Just out of curiosity, how many people have been to a high school reunion? Oh, that's a lot. I'm impressed. I was not sure about going. And sure enough, within the first minute of arriving in my high school reunion, I was, realized why I wasn't sure that I wanted to go. Somehow I walk into the room, all of a sudden I'm a 14-year-old boy again, with acne and braces, but with hair. <laughs> and you have that moment where you look around and you feel like you don't know anybody. And of course, a million things go through my head at that time. I realize that I'm part of a graduating class of Troy Athens High School of 450 people. I didn't know everybody when I was in high school, let alone now decades later afterward. And of course, we've aged a little bit since we graduated high school. Some of us have put on a few pounds. Some of us have lost a few pounds. Some of us had facial hair when they didn't have facial hair. And I walk into the room and you look around and there's nobody there you recognize. I don't know if you've ever had that moment. Right? And all of a sudden, you're in the high school cafeteria all over again, reliving adolescence. But sure enough, a few minutes passed, the crowd parted a little bit, and I saw the friends that I had actually come to see at my high school reunion. And then I was transported back to being 18 years old, king of the world. Invincible. I had hair then, too. And at 18, the whole world is laid out before you. And that's part of the beauty of the high school reunion, is when you go and you see these friends that you were in high school with, you're reminded of the you you had hoped to become. You're reminded of when you were 18 and the whole world was there before you, what you wanted to achieve what you hoped to accomplish, the dreams you had, how you were going to save the entire world. And there's something special about that moment when you're 18 or when you're at your high school reunion reminding yourself of when you're 18, that the whole world was before you and all you had was success and accomplishments ahead of you. That's the blessing of the high school reunion. And I was thinking about that fact as I was reading our Torah portion this morning, Parashat Vayera. And in it, really, it's the culmination of what started last week where God said to Abraham, Lech Lecha, go forth from this land from everything you know. And I will turn you, Abraham and Sarah, into a mighty nation, into a great people. And of course, as we come into this Torah portion, we begin to see why God chose Avraham, why God chose Abraham for this incredible mission. Of course, we have in our Torah portion this morning what is known as Akedat Yitzchak, what we read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, the binding of Isaac. And in that moment when Abraham is ready to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham demonstrates to God this true faith, this strong belief. Abraham was willing to do anything, including sacrificing his beloved child, for God. But in this morning's Torah portion, Parashat Vayera, we don't just read about Abraham's relationship with God. We actually read about Abraham arguing with God, challenging God. When God comes down and says to Abraham, I'm going to destroy so uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham doesn't just say, okay. Twice in the Torah portion it says, Chalila lecha, Abraham says to God, Chalila lecha, who are you, God? What are you doing? How dare you destroy the innocent along with the wicked? And Avram actually challenges God. He calls God out and says, God, I dare you. If I find righteous people in those towns, God, you can't destroy them. Now, of course, God relents, probably because God knew there was no one righteous in that town. But ultimately, Abraham is able to challenge God. Abraham stands up for those who are in need. Abraham pursues justice wherever he perceives injustice. And of course, we know, as Elias spoke beautifully earlier on, 
The Torah portion begins with Abraham and Sarah welcoming strangers into their tent. And we come to see as we look at what a nomadic life was, it wasn't just about having people over for Shabbos dinner. Though it's nice to have people over for Shabbos dinner. It's nice to have friends and family over. What Avram and Sarah did was they saw people who were in need, who'd been wandering the desert without food or water. And they not only gave them food and water, but they took them into their home. That's really what this mitzvah of Hachnasat or Chim is all about. It's about truly caring for those who are in need. Going out of our way, giving all of what we have to care for those who are in need. And there in our Parsha this morning, in Parshat Vayera, the entire Jewish future is laid out before Abraham. All Abraham really sees ahead of him is what God promises, which is an incredible nation, blessed by God. A nation built on two foundations. One, the foundation of faith, of having that special breed, that covenant between us and God. And two, the idea of tzedek, tzedek, terdov, justice, justice you shall pursue. It is a Jewish job to bring fairness to this world. It is a Jew's role to bring peace to this world. It is our responsibility to care for all those who are in need. And not unlike a high schooler ready to graduate, the entire future of the world was laid out before Abraham. And all he saw was hope and promise. Now, I'm sure like many of you here, I was just this past Sunday at the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda dinner. It was a wonderful event honoring Ronnie Klein, who's here with us this morning, Mazel Tov, Ronnie. And it was a great evening with more food than you could ever imagine in your life. And at that wonderful event, one of the, I think he was in sixth grade, a choir boy, who was singing the songs, he steps forward from the choir to say a few words. And he says that, there in the audience that evening of the 2,000 people was his grandfather, a particular Rav at the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda. And this young boy says, my grandfather, Kanei Nahara, has 100 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And of course, this boy proclaimed he was the favorite. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, 100 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And I looked around the room and I saw the 2,000 people who were sitting there in the room, among whom were probably 200 Orthodox Jews and 1,800 liberal Jews. And I thought about our community. And we know the demographics. We have done the research. We know how our community is going to change in the coming years. Now, not every Orthodox grandfather has a hundred grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But we know that because of birth rate alone, the Orthodox population in Detroit and throughout our country is skyrocketing. And we know because they've done the research, we know the demographics of liberal Judaism. We average two kids per family. A big family among liberal Jews is three kids. And we know from the statistics that rarely do 100% of those two or even three kids stay within the organized Jewish community. In Metro Detroit, which is a very affiliated community, we're even now down under 50% of synagogue affiliation. Now, this is math that even a rabbi can do. The demographics of liberal Judaism are going like this. The demographics of Orthodox Judaism are going like this. And as I was sitting there enjoying way too much food at the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda dinner, it was kosher, it's okay. The thought occurred to me, has the experiment of liberal Judaism failed? Has this experiment that we called liberal Judaism failed? Now, I'm thrilled for the Orthodox community that their numbers are only growing. That is a wonderful thing. That's good for the Jewish people. But I have to ask the question, are we failing? Or what have we done wrong to date? And if this experiment that is liberal Judaism has failed, what it will mean is that we'll see a world 
in which there no longer produced Albert Einstein's and Sigmund Freud's. No longer will there be a Hannah, a Hannah Arendt or a Philip Roth. No longer will there be a Brad Osmus. What happens when liberal Judaism disappears? I'll argue that the world will be a lesser place without our philosophy, without our idea that you have to balance living in the modern world with a commitment to Judaism, without the idea that we have to live a life of Torah, but also study philosophy, study the arts, study the sciences. And as Maimonides said a thousand years ago, if our understanding of scripture conflicts with something that science teaches us, we don't change the science, we change our understanding of scripture. We liberal Jews bring so much to this world. And I was thinking, imagine if Abraham only had Akedat Yitzhak, only had the binding of Yitzhak, and only had that affirmation of faith between him and God. But he didn't have that commitment to tzedek, that commitment to righteousness, to justice, to pursuing fairness and peace, to caring for those who are in need. When you look at the federation, not only in our own town, but throughout the country, if you look at all those federations, if you look at Jewish communal organizations like JFS, like Yad Ezra, like JVS, all of these organizations that truly reach out and care for the Jewish community, care for those who are in need, who are they run by? Who's volunteering for them? Who's supporting them financially? The liberal Jews. We're the ones stepping forward beyond our statistics, beyond what our demographics might suggest, to truly care for those who are in need. Imagine if that were to disappear. Now everybody's trying a different recipe to try to keep liberal Judaism strong. They're trying the Israel trips. We're trying youth group. We're trying better religious schools. We're trying to give more access and do better in our day schools. But no one of those pieces is a silver bullet. At the end of the day, if we want liberal Judaism to continue, we liberal Jews have to do a better job of showing our kids and grandchildren the joy that is Judaism, our love for Judaism. We liberal Jews have done a great job of showing our kids the obligations of Judaism. You have to go to Hebrew school because I went to Hebrew school. You have to give tzedakah because it's the right thing to do. But I think we as liberal Jews have failed in providing for our children and our grandchildren the true joy, the true love, the wonderfulness that is being Jewish and all that we Jews do for the world. This Shabbat of Parashat Vayera as we're reminded that Abraham had the dual obligation of affirming that faith in God, that special covenant between God and Abraham, that Abraham also had an obligation to care for all those who are in need, and that if the Jewish people are going to be successful, we can't just have that vertical line between us and God. We can't just have the horizontal line where we care for those in need, but we have no relationship with God. We have no celebration of what it means to be Jewish. We need both. I'm happy for the Orthodox community that they continue to grow in strength. The entire Jewish people will benefit from that. But we liberal Jews have to do a better job of providing joy and education and celebration to our children and to our grandchildren. There is no silver bullet to securing the future of liberal Judaism. But I look forward to partnering with you, please God, for many years to come in the efforts of rebuilding and strengthening and securing a very bright future for liberal Jews and for liberal Judaism. When we go to our high school reunions, we're reminded not only of what it means to be a 14-year-old scared in the cafeteria for the first time, but we're reminded of the us that we wanted to be, the bright future that was ahead of us. 
this Shabbat of Parashat Vayera. May we be reinvigorated by that vision of a bright future for the Jewish people, a future dedicated to the Brit, to the covenant between us and God, but also to doing what we do best, which is caring for those in need. Kenya may this be God's will. And let us say together, Amen.